Guys, if anyone hasn't met me before, I'm Maffey. I serve in the staff team here at Christ City Church. And if this is your first time, you're so welcome. We're really glad you've decided to join us. We're a church in Dublin that is committed to making a positive impact for Jesus in Dublin spiritually, socially, and culturally. And so to everyone here, guys, I want to really encourage you and thank you for signing up, for, for bearing with us, for going through the, the steps, for going through the process of signing up to be here, of getting your ticket, putting in the details, putting in the email address every single week. And guys, under normal circumstances, it shouldn't have to be this way, and we shouldn't have to jump through all these hoops. But I want, you to, I want, to, I want to thank you for persevering. I want to thank you in the past six weeks for persevering with us and, and, and going through this. And we're going to have to continue it throughout the summer. And so I want to encourage you to continue persevering um, and doing what, it do, doing what it takes in order to get to church, doing what it takes in order to even bring friends, bring family, bring people who don't know Jesus to church. And so even though we've got room for 50 people, usually we do have a few spare seats. And so if, uh, if you feel that, um, that you're, you're not going to come because you're, you're, you're not serving in a particular week or because you want to give somebody else a chance to come, sign up anyway. Even if it puts you, puts you on, to the, on the waiting list, sign up anyway. And if we get to 50, then you can join online. If there's a free seat, an opening, then you'll get contacted and you'll get to come. Anyway, so even though we're still limited to 50 spaces, I'd really encourage you, and especially you guys online as well, I encourage you to, to sign up and come back in person whenever you're able and whenever you're ready. Because we usually do have a few spare tickets every week. And, uh, and so anyway, we'd love to see it absolutely rammed every single week. So over to the online guys, we have Grace as an online host today. So guys, do you want to wave and say hi to Grace? I don't know what way you'd wave. You might want to wave backwards. Hey, Grace. Good to, good to see you over here. Wonderful, there we go. All right, so a couple of housekeeping uh, rules. We have got the female toilets out this way and we have the male toilets out this way to the left. And then whenever the service finishes, if you just want to promptly exit via your left, which is my right, that's wonderful. And uh, we've got crash facilities set up as usual uh, down in the kitchen. So feel free to use them uh, as and when uh, you wish. Uh, Louise is going to come up and she's going to give the, the call to worship and then afterwards we're, we're going to go on to a time of reflection where we, we remain seated and we can't sing out loud but we can sing quietly or we can hum as well. So over, over to you Louise. So Colossians 1 13 to 14 says he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So further in Colossians, Paul um, encourages us that God um, has chosen us. So he's uh, graciously delivered us from the dominion of darkness into relationship with his son, and that we are too holy and beloved by God. So as we have been able to forgive um, and have, we have been forgiven as we are loved so we can love others, um, so yeah, as we come to worship this afternoon, let us remember um, the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus and the mercy that we have been shown to transfer us from the darkness into light. Uh, and I, I pray, uh, as Paul writes, may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Amen.
church we're now going to uh, have a time of prayer and uh, there's going to be short pauses in between my moments of praying where you can just in your heart pray when I was a teenager I got taught a very simple model for prayer which still is the model I use most days to take a passage of scripture and to use the acts model something to adore God for something to confess something to thank God for and then something to ask, supplication is a fancy word. So we're just going to do that, and after each one, there'll be a moment of quiet, and I encourage you just to take that moment to adore, to, th- uh, to confess, to thank, and to ask, supplicate. And uh, the song that was just sang, I'm sure, was based a lot from Psalm 103. So I'm going to be basing this a little bit off Psalm 103. So let's pray. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Heavenly Father, we praise you because you are good. We praise you for the many benefits that we have through Jesus. We thank you, as the psalmist says, for your forgiveness of our sins. We praise you, Lord, that we have healing now and forever, one day perfectly. We thank you and praise you that you are gracious and compassionate. 
When we are at our worst, your heart is most drawn towards us as a father has compassion on his children. We thank you, Lord, that in you, our desires are fully and finally satisfied. We thank you that it says here that you are a God who works righteousness and justice for the oppressed. Father, as we study the book of Amos, we think about the needs in our world and the areas of injustice. Lord, you're not like us. We look at might and wealth and power and savvy and we are impressed. It draws our attention. You look at the poor, the lowly, and the oppressed, and your heart is drawn to them. We praise you, Lord, for being such a just and compassionate God. Take a moment there just to praise God in your heart for who he is. Lord, as we think about your great character, your love, your goodness, your grace, your compassion, your justice, we are quick to realize how we fall short of your standards, how this week we have not acted kindly and lovingly and gently, and we have not sought justice. Lord, we look at the Israelites and we see how quickly they fell into idolatry and were stubborn and petulant and proud and and sought security and false gods, and we look at them as if we're different. And Lord, we take a moment to confess that so often we are self-seeking, we are self-serving, and we're looking to make sure we're okay before we think about you and other people. We confess, Lord, not just our sins of commission, the things we've done that we shouldn't have done, but the sins of omission, the things we haven't done that we should have done. We're so grateful, Lord, for your forgiveness, but we take a moment to say sorry for the things we've said and thought and done this week that have not loved you and have not loved our neighbor. Just take a moment in the silence to confess your sin. And so we move to thanksgiving, Father. We say thank you that you will not always accuse, nor will you harbor your anger forever, that you do not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your love from us. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that through faith we are not just forgiven, we're not just made righteous, but we're adopted as children. And there's a closeness and a warmth that we receive through Jesus. And we thank you too, not just for our salvation, but for all the good gifts in creation you've given us. We thank you for our health and our strength. We thank you for our work and our play. We thank you for our family and our friends. We thank you for all the food that we enjoy. We thank you for the shelter and the homes that we live in. We thank you, Lord, for the sun that is shining, for the sea that looks so beautiful, for the mountains that are so majestic, for the sky above that is so marvelous. We thank you for everything in this creation, which is for our joy and for your glory. And we praise you that you are not a stingy God, but a generous God. Take a moment to thank God for something this week that maybe you've taken for granted. And so finally, Father, we come to ask you for things in our lives, in our church, and in this world. Lord, at this time, we continue to lift up our government who needs your wisdom. And we pray that they would walk uprightly. As we've heard of politicians in the UK this week who have not walked uprightly, we ask that you'd give the courage to our politicians and those around the world making big decisions to walk uprightly and to honor you and to fear you. We pray for wisdom 
at this time, but we also pray, Lord, for sustainability through what must be a grueling time to be politicians and leaders in business and, and the healthcare sector and other sectors, the leaders in our country that have had a long, long time of having to navigate tricky days. We give them, would you give them strength and perseverance and patience and sustainability? We pray particularly for the hospitality sector that's taken another knock this week. Just ask them, Lord, for your grace and your patience through these days. We pray too, Lord, outside of our own country, for the world around us. And again, we just think of Palestine is the first thing I think of, Father. Seeing a picture this morning, Lord, of a child holding a dolly in a broken up home from a bomb in Palestine. Lord, have mercy. Would you bring an end to war? Would you bring peace and resolution? And would you bring comfort to all those who are caught up in that trauma? And finally, Father, I pray for us as a church family that this summer, that we might take summer holidays. In our spiritual life, we'd not take a holiday, but we'd be very much warm to you, close to you, drawing near to you. And through these tricky days, Lord, all the challenges, keep us close together, loving one another, caring for one another, looking out for one another, honoring one another. May we be aware of those who are in challenging times that we might care for them. May we be aware of those that find summer harder because of isolations or the plans that have been dashed. Lord, may we be your church community that love you and love one another this summer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. What what a great model to, to, to pray. A C T S. So, what what do we have? We've adoration. What's what's second? C. Con- confession. Wonderful. I nearly forgot. Ah, uh, look at that. You guys have got me. Come on, Mihai. You need to sort that out. There we go. So we've adoration. We've confession. What's next? Thanksgiving. And then finally, supplication. Amazing. That's so good. Guys, if you've, anyone's just joined us, then you're so welcome. We're at our point in the service where we're going to be doing our icebreaker. So I'd like to invite Leanne up. Where is she? There she is. So in our icebreaker today, we are going to be looking at what is your favorite Irish saying? Now, whenever I say Irish saying, it may well be an English word. It may well be an English phrase, but it's basically renowned to be Irish. Or if you have an Irish phrase that is actually Irish, Uh, like Emma probably does, then that would be amazing. So turn to the person next to you. If you're not sitting beside somebody, turn around. And next couple of minutes, find out what your favorite Irish phrase is. All right, church, I want to bring you back in again. I want to bring you back in. We have got some real hilarious ones. Mine is always, what's the crack? And so whenever I'm on a call, a staff call with Audrey every week, I ask her what, what the crack is. That's the very first thing. And she looks at me in a weird way. But she should know at this point what, what the crack means. There are some fantastic ones online. Uh, so Margaret says, it'll be grand. That's amazing. Uh, I put in one that says, I will, yeah, which means no. So whenever somebody asks me to do something, I'll say, I will, yeah, absolutely means no. So you're going to have to ask me again. Uh, uh, Marie says, oh, oh, the weather is not too bad. <laughs> not so bad. <laughs> the sharp says, I'll be there in a minute. So whenever I say I'm going to be there in a minute, you know it's probably going to be 15. Somebody else said, <laughs> grand. So basically everything is grand, isn't it? Yeah. Leanne, what's yours? Uh, I'm going to say slauncha, which so, means cheers. Does and it? usually you say that whenever you're like celebrating, you're having a good time. What, yeah. what, what is welcome then? If slauncha means cheers, what's welcome? Vulture. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other phrases? You, you were a primary school teacher? Not in Irish, though. Not I was Irish. up north. <laughs> oh, come on. They wouldn't give me a job here because I couldn't speak Irish. <laughs> That's fair enough. I would love somebody to shout out what that says. Ah, oh, fantastic. Unbelievable. What an accent. That's amazing. That's amazing. Guys, this is our point of service where we are going to let our kids get out to the den. So, time for the kids to go, and I would love to pray for our kids as they head out along with Shannon and Emma. Jesus, I I thank you that uh, that your church is not just for a particular age group, that it's not for adults, but it is for absolutely everybody. 
And Father, we thank you for the noise of our kids and our babies. And uh, I, I thank you that what, it is such a privilege that we have got children, that we have got babies here at Christ City Church. And that they are not the church of tomorrow, but they're the church of today. And that in, in 10 years' time, hopefully, I'll be sitting in a seat down there listening to one of them get to lead the service or preach even. Um, so, Father, I thank you that, that you use adults, you use kids, that you use absolutely everybody. And so, Father, I thank you for the leaders as well who are going to be essentially carrying you, Jesus, to our kids and to teach them and to invest in them in your name. Amen. Amen. So, guys, for the news today, we have prayer and worship night coming up on Wednesday week. It's not this Wednesday, the following Wednesday, 7th of July, 7.30, 8.30. It's going to be in person and it's going to be online. I'd encourage you, if you can, come along in person. Uh, guys, it's, it's always great getting to worship Jesus side by side with brothers and sisters. And it is always a good time. So, Wednesday week. Second one is baptisms. So, uh, Stephen Tuddy is actually going to get baptised on the 11th of July down at Sea Point in the sea. So we're so excited to celebrate and we're really delighted to get, get to do this with Stephen. So it's going to be the 11th of July down at Sea Point. The time is depending and it's, it's TBC because of tides. So I, I don't know, Scott, you, you're probably the most expert here when it comes to tides. So you can tell us when high tide is, but we can chat afterwards. So it's going to be dependent on tides. And if you want to come along, please do come along to support uh, Stephen. And if you've not been baptized and you want to be baptized, then please contact Steve and give, give him a shout and, uh, and he will take it up from there. So, Leanne, over to you. Yeah, so after the success of the Singleness and Lockdown Seminar, we are running a singleness course. So it's going to be over four weeks and it's going to be really interactive. It's going to be a time where people can come together and chat about the challenges but also the opportunities that come whenever you're single and um, it's a time to encourage people practically emotionally spiritually just how to kind of live a life that glorifies god while you are single uh, it's going to start on tuesday the 13th of july and if you're interested you can contact him or vanessa and they will sign you up and the last one, it's probably the announcement I'm most excited about. It's the Summer Community Banquet. It was probably one of the first things me and Anto came to whenever we first joined the church. And I think for us, it really showed us the heart of what CCC is about, which is community. Um, but not just the community in here, the community outside of the church walls. Um, lockdown has been a really hard time for everyone over the past year but especially for the people in the city who are more disadvantaged. So we want this to be an opportunity where we can invite people in to have some food, have some music, have really good conversations, and share a little bit of the hope that we know we have in God that maybe they haven't yet realized. Um, whenever we did it, it wasn't just great to kind of come and attend. It was really encouraging to be a part of. So I would encourage you, whether you want to be more up front or behind the scenes, there is a role that you can play, even if it's just inviting one other person to come. Um, yeah, so if you want to be involved, contact Maffy or Ola, but I would encourage you to do it because it's a really great event. Amen, Leon, thank you. Absolutely put that date in the diary. Keep that day free and uh, either Ola or I will be in touch. So feel free to say no to us, but feel absolutely free to say yes as well. Uh, I know, Steve, that's funny. I'm going to uh, ask you. But anyway, Kelsey, do you want to come up and do the reading? And then you can pray. And then Katie is going to come up and she's going to bring the word. All right, so the reading is Amos 5, verses 18 to 27. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand only on the wall, only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light? Pitch dark without a ray of brightness. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. 
Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you have made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. And I'll pray for Katie before she speaks. Lord, we thank you just for the privilege of hearing this truth, God. We thank you that you've handpicked these verses for us today, Lord. And we just thank you what a privilege it is to have Katie in the church, Lord, and just all the gifts that you've given her, um, including the gift of teaching, Lord. And we pray that you just give her courage and comfort today as she speaks, that what's important to you would be made important to us through her, Lord. And I just pray that the message today would be uh, just infused by you, Lord, that your spirit would be in the message and that it would be a blessing to us as a congregation. In your name, amen. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Katie, if you haven't met me before. Um, and hello to online people as well. Hope everyone's doing well today. Um, so I have graduated as a history student from Trinity. <laughs> Thanks. And um, I've been coming to CCC for about four years now. As a past history student, I have somewhat of an interest in world history, European history, Asian history. But let's take a recent example of modern British history that we'll all be familiar with. The Harry and Meghan interview with Oprah Winfrey in March of this year, when the royal couple released bombshell after bombshell of issues of race, mental health and broken relationships that were hidden from behind the palace doors. Everything appeared good in front of the public eye, yet it came to be revealed that there was simply empty tradition that was being followed. As a student of history, it's my role to be curious into the agendas and motivations of these dynamics. What is real? What is a facade? Do the ends of wealth and prosperity justify the means of empty behaviours that follow tradition but lack in sincerity and consideration of others? Well, what we do know is this, that in Israel, in the book of Amos, sincerity was missing and relationship was absent. Israel appeared to be doing all the right things from the outset, but there is a fundamental lack of justice and righteousness. Selfish ambition allowed a trap of injustice. Today, here now, we need to prepare our hearts to learn from this passage about God's heart so we can avoid this trap of empty religion and focus on the importance of relationship with our God. So before we get into our points, let's look at the story so far. We've got King Jeroboam. He took rule in 785 BC. The Israelites lived under him in a bubble of injustice and evil. They levied a straw tax on the poor, sold the innocent for slavery and crushed the needy. As Steve showed us last week, the Israelites chose to serve idols and comfort. They had God and gods and lavished themselves in their stone mansions with lush vineyards. As chapter 5 continues, we see to an even greater extent the brokenness of the Israelites. They believed their religious practices of offerings and festivals were good. They believed it brought them gain and earned them salvation, that the ends of wealth justified the means of neglecting the poor. 
But here God tells Amos to warn them once more. And the verses reveal to us where they've got it wrong and how to go right. We see the emphasis on true worship, our first point, and true relationship, our second point. So we're going to look at how the passage shows us what God values and then how we can apply these values to our lives today. If you look with me at verses 18 to 24, we see that God values true worship, number one. Look at verse 19 with me. We are given the imagery of a man entering his house and resting his hand on a wall only to be bitten by a snake. The place where the man believed to be safest, his own home, betrayed him. Amos shows us the Israelites' false sense of security in their acts of religion, when in fact it was their religion that was going to come back and bite them. The Israelites' neglect of the vulnerable and poor revealed the values that lay at the core of their heart. Personal prosperity and ambition. It wasn't true worship. It was empty religion. Empty religion has consequences and God's justice was surely going to respond to this. Verse 20. God tells him, that there will be no light on the day of the Lord for the Israelites, that only gain from their worship will be darkness, pitch black darkness. They neglected relationship with God. They've neglected relationship with the lower class of people of the city, sticking only to the comfort of their religious circles. They believed they were safe, from the day of judgment and their offerings were enough but their real worship actually lay in their affluence and God had sent Amos to tell them that the consequences are real and transformation is needed otherwise as in verse 27 they would be exiled beyond Damascus I wonder if you think going to church on a Sunday is enough is that true worship Do you think that you're safe? Look at verses 21 to 23. We see God give the Israelites a wake-up call. God's disgust towards the religious festivals and assemblies is so poignant. Notice the language. I hate, I despise, stench, I will not accept, I have no regard, I will not listen. I think God makes his view of their worship crystal clear. This isn't true worship. God says, don't sing to me if you're imposing heavy taxes to keep the poor poor. Don't give me the noise of your music and play the harps if you're not willing to give an innocent a voice in the courts. God despises this empty religion. The Israelites have got it wrong. They've missed the point of true worship. Well, what is the point of true worship? If all these acts of religion are wrong, what is right? What is true worship? Do you see the answer in the passage, verse 24? But let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. This is what God values. Look with me at verses 25. To 27. God values true relationship. I think I just skipped out a little bit. That's okay. We're just going to go back. That's okay. That's okay. We're not going that far. Okay, we're here. Okay, brilliant. This is what God values. <laughs> Let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. The whole book of Amos is rich in these themes of justice and righteousness. But what do they actually mean? And what does it look like to worship in this way? If we go back to the original Hebrew of the words, we can take justice, to mean taking concrete actions to correct injustice and care for victims of injustice. And we can take righteousness to mean living in fair and generous relationships with others 
despite social differences. For example, it's one thing to write letters to your TDs about the unaffordable housing schemes, a concrete action, justice. And another thing to offer someone your house to live in while they search for somewhere else. Generous living, righteousness. Here's another example. It's one thing to protest sex trafficking, a concrete action, justice. And it's another to volunteer with a charity that invests time into the people abused. Fair and generous relationship despite differences. Righteousness. There's a need for both. Israel was doing neither. So how can we make sure that we don't end up like Israel at risk of falling into the trap of false religion that is void of true worship? Now look with me at verses 25 to 27. God values true relationship, point two. God condemned the Israelites' relationship with other idols and their adoration of false gods and shrines. They were void of proper relationship with God. The religion that they'd got caught up in blinded their view of their only relationship that would ever fulfill and consequently blinded them from the value of justice and righteousness. God is using Amos to reach out to the Israelites, to alert them to their sin. God knew that idols would undoubtedly fail the people, and he wanted to save them from that. God wanted the Israelites back. God desired a relationship with his chosen people and wanted to show them their error so they could turn back to him. He values true relationship. At the end of verse 26, Amos says that the religious acts, they were for yourselves. Their worship was to build and prosper themselves. The Israelites had misplaced their trust and hope and placed it in materialism, instant satisfaction, instant satisfaction and glamour. They were selfish. They cared only about themselves, how to keep the rich, rich. They didn't care about God and they didn't care about victims of injustice or caring for generous relationships. But this passage does show us that God wanted them back. Yeah, that this path, that God did want them back. God values true relationship and through a true relationship with God, we become shaped by him and then we care. Without this route, we only offer empty religion and we live for ourselves. Our hearts become conditioned by our own desires, not God's. True relationship with God is shown through the evidence of loving others. That's what Israel had wrong. Their evidence of lip service and going through the motions reveals their neglect of God and by extension, neglect of the poor and needy. So, the question that we are left with is this. How can we find true relationship with Jesus, with God? Jesus. <laughs> Through the better Amos that would come 800 years later. Like Israel, while we were dead in our sins, God made a way for us to come into relationship with him. And it is through his son, Jesus. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, describe it brilliantly. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. God made a way. If we choose to enter into this true relationship with Jesus and spend time in prayer and devotion, we become more like him. Our hearts align. His desires become our desires and we care about generous and fair relationship with others. 
because we value relationship with Jesus and therefore we value true worship, which is righteousness and justice, caring for the marginalized of society and being concerned for the poor. We love because he first loved us. Our worship shifts from an emptiness to a fullness because our motivations are not of our own, but of God's. When asked by a Pharisee, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great commandment. And second, you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is true worship. This is the value of true relationship with God. So, what does your worship stem from? Who do you love first? We need to learn from the mistakes of the Israelites and listen to this warning of idolatry. We need to consider what we are letting shape us and harming how we worship. For myself, it's the opinion of other people. Am I funny enough, entertaining enough, am I cool enough? I allow that to mold my motivations and my actions. It's for myself, not for God, and certainly not for other people. I wonder what could be your idol as you sit here today. Maybe it's that you're seen as the perfect Christian on a Sunday, but you don't care about your colleagues during the week. Maybe it's making the most money, being the parent that everyone knows at school, being the saviour of a situation. Maybe you idolise comfort and glamour. Maybe you idolise scandal, gossip and the excitement that comes with it. What do we let condition us that is not in line with the heart of God? Where do we seek comfort instead of allowing ourselves to be disadvantaged for the disadvantaged because we're not seeking true relationship with God? How can we learn to live lives of true worship? Through valuing our relationship with Christ Jesus, our God and Saviour, knowing the sacrifices he made for us in the scriptures, spending time in his presence. Our worship will then be more than just a tick box exercise, but it will reveal the evidence of caring about injustice, about actively reforming the institutions that keep the poor, poor, responding at a local level to radically love the needy, vulnerable and innocent. Not because you're trying to change the world, but because you care about God's people, because you understand more about what God values, and that's why you care. This challenges me to think, well, where do I think I'm too safe? Where is God trying to give me a wake-up call? Where do I need to allow God to transform my heart and work on my relationship with him and allow myself to overflow with justice and righteousness? I know personally, over the past few years, the one thing that caught me out in worship was reading my Bible every day. In fact, it was the desire to read my Bible that wasn't even there. I would come to church to serve on visuals and not have read my Bible that week. I wasn't seeking relationship with God. My serving was only empty religion, and my heart didn't care. I valued going to a nightclub two or three times a week and then being too tired to read the word of God the next morning. My heart wasn't shaped. And as a further result, I didn't care enough about displaying radical love to the vulnerable of the church family. I cared only about myself. But my empty religion, my hypocrisy, my selfish heart, it was corrected by Jesus. And here's how he did it. He led me towards getting involved in a life group that helped me understand the true desires of my heart. And 
He put a good group of Christian friends around me where, we, where I witnessed daily Bible reading being modeled every day. Nothing of me, everything of God. So, what does an overflow of true relationship look like? Through relationship with Jesus, we begin to want to care. Our worship becomes full, not empty. And this passage in Amos offers a challenge to the corporate church today. How can we, because of true relationship, consider how to actively fight for justice by counteracting the institutions that keep the poor poor? Is it to gather in your city groups and write emails to your TD or local brands, philanthropists and world leaders about the homeless crisis, poverty, the environment, slavery, domestic abuse, the list could go on. Or is it to use your life group to explore government petitions that could change legislation and sign them together? And what about righteousness? The generous and right and fair living regardless of any social difference. Amos offers us a personal challenge. Where do I let religion trump relationship in my personal worship? Where am I religious but not living a life of justice? Have I ever sang a worship song but been gossiping 15 minutes before church about the person I'm sitting beside? Have I given my tithe to church that month but not paid for my work colleague's coffee because I want to make sure I have enough for myself the next day? Does the face of my Sunday self when I come to serve and worship match the face of my Saturday night and Monday morning? Do justice and righteousness pour out from every breath, thought, word and action. I don't know about you, but I know that I've fallen into the practices of the selfish, religiously pious Israelites. But thank the Lord that I have Jesus. Thank the Lord that God knows that as a human race, we are hopeless at offering true worship and desiring true relationship. Thank the Lord he wanted the Israelites back. He wants me back. He wants you back. He sent his son to die on a cross so we could have a right relationship with him. And through this relationship, see God's heart for justice and righteousness clearer so that our hearts and relationships can be shaped and we can love God first and then love our neighbour radically and abundantly and care about taking steps towards fighting injustice. Thank the Lord that no matter how many times we get it wrong and practice religion over relationship, that it is our God who will forever change the history books on the final day of judgment because he will allow justice to flow like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. I'd like to invite Leanne and Will up um, to get ready for our worship and let us pray. Yeah, Heavenly Father, um, we just give thanks for who you are, God, and for this message in Amos. Um, We thank you that you rescued us, God, that you wanted us back. Father, we confess that we are prone to going towards religion rather than relationship. We seek fulfillment elsewhere rather than in you, God, and we're sorry for that. But thank you that you sent Jesus for us, God. Thank you that you made a way for us to have a right relationship. Thank you that Jesus exampled how to truly worship challenge us, Father, to love you first today, to only idolise you, and then we will overflow with justice and righteousness. Father, reveal to us where we can love people well, but love you first. Thank you, Jesus, in your precious name.
Amen. Amen. I wonder if we could respond by standing. You know, to say to God, so I'm not playing the right chord there, it's not helpful. Um, to say to God, yeah, I want my heart to align with yours, and I know that I need Jesus to do that. So maybe, I know we can't sing out loud, but if you could stand with me. And we look to Jesus to be able to do all those things, to be able to live righteously, to live generously, to seek justice. We need Jesus. Forbidden Lord 
of so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. God, I thank you that because of your great love for us, you made us alive in Christ Jesus. God, we're sorry for the moments that our motivations are selfish. Whenever everything looks good on the outside, but, but really we're, we're not there on the inside. And Jesus, we, we say that we're coming back to the heart of worship today. Because it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Lord, we're sorry for the, the things that we've made it when it's all about you, Jesus. Mm. It's all about you, Jesus, mm. in your name. Amen. 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 Guys, that's the end of our service. But listen, we're, we're going to go outside and we're going to chat and we're going to hang out. If you're coming back to the heart of worship, if this has been a moment for you today when, when you say, you know what, I, I want to come back to the heart of worship. And c- come and chat to Katie. Come and chat to myself. Pull us aside. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to chat with you. And don't, don't let the moment escape. Your hands might be sweaty. You, you, your might, heart might be beating. But don't, don't miss out in that moment. Hmm. Amen. 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 So guys, that's the end of our service. If you want, please make your way promptly outside. That would be wonderful. And here's a few notices on the screen. So thanks for today and see you soon, guys.